Thank you so much for being here. And I know we have a bunch of people online too. So today's interesting because I am in charge of Grand Rounds and I'm also giving Grand Rounds today. So bear with me. I'll introduce myself. Um, I'm Suzanne Mazur. My name is spelled a little differently than it's pronounced. Um, I'm the Director of Continuing Medical Education here at Seattle Children's. I'm also an ER attending and a TOX attending here. My name's spelled different than it sounds, which I think is maybe why most people just call me Mazur in the world, which I love. I'm a Midwesterner. I did my training, a peds residency, a long time ago in Cincinnati, and then I did two fellowships in Chicago, one for pediatric emergency medicine at Northwestern, and then a second one at Cook County Hospital um, for toxicology. And that's a little bit of a weird path into toxicology, so I'm one of just kind of a handful of pediatric toxicologists, which is really, really fun. And I moved here in 2004, and I've been an ER attending and toxicologist here since then. Hello! And then in, I think, 2016, I took over being in charge of Grand Rounds and continuing medical education. Um, and I have not yet given a Grand Rounds during the time I've been in charge of it, but we decided today's the day, mostly because we had kind of a late cancellation, but also because I think this is a great topic to start the year with. Um, so I'll use my platform to also say that if you have ideas or you want to give a Grand Rounds, send me an email and let me know and I can do that for you. All right, so we'll get started with learning today. It is very, very nerve-wracking being up here, so I appreciate all of you being here. All right, I will start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we live and work on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Squamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations, and pay our respect to elders past and present. This is part of our commitment to working to create an inclusive and respectful partnership. And in that vein, if you would like an action item um, for this topic, I found this Martin Oliver Memorial Endowed Fund. Martin Oliver was a Native American artist who created the whale sculpture that's at Seattle Children's. And there's an endowed fund in his name through the UW. So if you have the means, attendings, or if you want to learn more, everyone else, check it out at the UW website. Um, I have no financial conflicts of interest. I'm not going to talk about anything unapproved or investigative in this talk. However, I do have my own disclaimer. Um, some of you may have seen this before. But this is my own child who was unsupervised by me, a pediatric toxicologist, in 2005 and got into a bottle of Tylenol. And so this, this video, he's so cute, right? And he's totally fine. I did the calculation quickly and realized that it was not a toxic ingestion. So I filmed it for you, and I've been using it in talks since then. Um, he's really, really happy that I still do this. But this is just a message to say that, first of all, I have a cute kid that's now an adult. Second of all, poison prevention is truly, truly for everyone. And even if you've had several fellowships and lots of lectures, it's still something to think about for yourself and then also educating your patients. And I couldn't show that without showing a follow-up slide, and he's totally OK. All right, so my objectives for today. I'll talk a little bit about the demographics of pediatric poisoning and toxicology. Kind of mixed in with this, I'll talk about the poison centers in the United States and what we do here at Seattle Children's and in Washington in terms of toxicology. And then I'll just go through, since it's the beginning of the year, I'll go through what we think about in tox in terms of a general approach to a poisoned patient. When we see one in the ER, on the floor, in clinic, what we think about, what we go through. And then if we have time at the end, I'll do two cases and then leave lots of time for questions. So first of all, why is this an important topic for Grand Rounds? Um, in 2020, overdose for kids ages 1 through 19 became the number three cause of death for our pediatrics in the US. Firearms, as most of us know, has leaped to number one. Um, MVAs or car accidents, number two, and then overdose, number three. So important to know about. Um, there are a few things happening in the world that we'll talk about that have contributed to this number getting higher. Um, but it's always been a problem, and it's something we all need to know as pediatricians. Luckily, in the United States, we have a great system for poison center learning and teaching and um, real-time care for poisoned patients. 
Um, we have poison centers. And even though there are 50 states in the US, somehow there are 55 poison centers. Some states have more than one. And some states are covered by another state. But the number kind of works out to be 55. Um, in Washington, we have the Washington Poison Center, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but all of these poison centers are available to all of us in the US 24-7, 365. And all of them have a national number. So no matter where you move, if you call this 800 number, you will be routed to the closest poison center to you. So it's really helpful to have this number in your phone, on your um, wall at home, or wherever you might need it in case you need to call. And I'll talk about why it's important to use that number um, for documentation of things that we see. And then just a little bit about the history of the Washington Poison Center. It was established in 1956. Some of you might recognize Dr. Robertson, who's also on the wall outside the House staff office. Um, he was the uh, original Mr. Yuck pediatric toxicologist. And he was here when I was here, when I came here in 2004, and is one of the reasons why I joined this Poison Center, because he was hilarious and amazing. Um, and within the Poison Center now, we have a big staff of certified specialists in poison information. We call them spies, because that sounds way cooler. Um, most of them have a background in either nursing or pharmacy, and then on top of that, they've gotten a certification in poison information. So those are the people who are answering that 800 number when you call, um, and they are great. They have a wealth of information, and also in front of them, they have a deep uh, source of resources, both micromedics, which I'll show you at the end, and also poison center guidelines that we've all developed over time. So when you make your first call, either if you're at home or if you're in the ER, you'll get in touch with one of these C spies or spies. And they'll kind of get you started on the case. And then from there, if they need medical backup, that's when they call one of us. Um, so there's eight medical toxicologists right now serving the Washington Poison Center as backup for these spies. So one of us is on call every day. When they get a call from here at Seattle Children's, they paid me first. So I am your backup for Seattle Children's when I'm available. If I'm not, there's seven other amazing toxicologists that can do that job too. So the way to get a hold of me if you have a tox question, a lot of people text me directly, which I love and is great. Um, but also you can call through the Poison Center. So why are US Poison Centers important? We have a whole association between all 55 Poison Centers. And they maintain a database where information is uploaded in real time. So because of this database, we kind of know what's going on in the toxicology world, and maybe more quickly than if poison centers were working in silos. So because all this information is uploaded in real time, we can identify things, trends that are happening early, um, and see if there's something going wrong more quickly than if we're just working individually. So from this data, we know that there are about two and a half million human exposures, meaning calls to poison centers um, in the US every year. And that, up, that uh, adds up to about one poison exposure every 13 seconds. And then important for our pediatric population who spend a lot of time at home, 93% of these poisoning exposures happen in the home of the child or teen. And then most of these cases are actually pediatric, what we would define as pediatric, right? So there's two kind of peaks where we see poisoned kids. And this seems obvious, but I'll just go through it. Toddlers exploring the world with their mouth. Ben Mazur, great example, right? Finding something, ingesting it. Usually it's one thing. It's discovered by the family fairly quickly. They make a call or come to the ER relatively soon. And then there's kind of a lull, age 7 to 11, where we don't see too much poisoning. Um, and then we get to the teenagers, who often are either trying to have fun, trying to do self-harm, experimenting, often will take more than one thing in a clandestine way, maybe not discovered right away or not telling anyone right away. So kind of a different combination of symptoms that can be more severe. So we really do see kind of two peaks within this pediatric age group, but most of poison center work actually has to do with kids. And then when we think about what's most common, there's a lot of ways to look at this data. Um, one way is just looking at poison center calls. And when we look at poison center phone calls, the most common thing that poison center, the spies get called for, are things that are at home. So if you just like think about what's in your cabinets, 
those are the things that kids are going to most likely get into. Within this list, there are some things that are more or less toxic, and it's impossible to learn all of that right now. Um, but there are some things on the list. I'll point out batteries and magnets that can be really, really serious ingestions. And so that's why it's really important to have families call the poison center right away when something's been ingested. We see a lot of kids who just are brought to the ED, and that's fine too. But if they're breathing and alert, the first thing to do is actually call the poison center and get direction on if this is a serious intoxication or not. And then another way to look at this data by ED visits, so visits to the emergency room. This is a list of common things that we see for kids who actually make it past that poison center phone call if they decide to do that and come to the ED. Again, if you look at this list, it's kind of obvious, right? It's things that are in most people's homes, like acetaminophen, bleach, laundry detergent packets, and then parents or grandparents, blood pressure medicines, and other over-the-counter medicines. So this is common things are common. Things that are in their house are going to be most likely to be ingested by pediatric patients. And then when we think about deaths, this is another category. Luckily, in our world of pediatric toxicology, deaths are pretty rare. But over time, we've seen many more really sad stories with opioid ingestion in all ages for different reasons and in different formulations. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But this slide just shows that like, over time, the opioid ingestion is really the main reason for pediatric poisoning fatalities now. Um, I put a picture of iron and blister packs up there because of history. When I was in training, which was in the 90s in Cincinnati, um, but all over the U.S., iron was a really huge part of our toxicology training. Iron ingestion was really common. Um, the reason was a lot of people who are toddler age also have a pregnant parent who is on prenatal iron. At that time, prenatal iron was packaged in these big containers and it was sugar coated and it really looked a lot like candy. Um, since the 90s, some rules have changed, including this is voluntary, but most people who make iron do not sugar coat anymore and package it in those blister packs. You know, those annoying things that like takes forever to get the iron out of that is to protect kids. So because of those things that happened in the US between the 90s and now, we don't see as much iron poisoning as we used to by far. Um, however, it is still a really important thing to know about. Um, it's still on boards a lot, so it's important to read about if you haven't seen it in the ED. And it's important to tell families who have prenatal iron to keep it out of reach of kids. All right, so I'll switch gears a little bit now just to talk about how we as toxicologists approach a, poisoning, a poisoned patient. So if you're seeing a poisoned patient in front of you or you're about to call the poison center, what are the things that we want to know and what are the things that are important? And this is pretty straightforward, actually. History and physical rule the day, just like in a lot of things in medicine. So history, super important to us. We want to know what's at home. Um, we want to see the container. We know that now people shop in big box stores and they have supersized containers of things. A great example, I'll look at Dr. Brogan for this, is ibuprofen, which is not all that toxic unless you really can ingest a large amount of it. But now these large amounts are being sold and we've had some cases where patients had to be on ECMO because of something like ibuprofen. Um, we also, if you have a pill that's loose, you can Google the imprint ID on it and it will lead you to what that pill is. So in most cases, medicine that's made in the US, you, you're able to Google that. We used to have a special website for it, but now you can Google it and the same information is available. And then if somebody comes in with an empty bottle and everything's gone and no one can account for any that have been taken by anyone in the family, we always assume the worst. So we count what's left, we assume the rest is inside your patient. And then we always want to know the timing. The timing is really important, um, but maybe not for the reason you think. A lot of times we think about, people ask me like, well, what's the half-life? Like, when is this going to be over? When can I send this patient home? But in ingestion, half-life kind of goes out the window because when you ingest a whole bunch of medicine, everything slows down and sometimes half-life can be much, much longer. But we still want to know timing because we have some cool nomograms and other ways of figuring out how bad this could be based on what time things were ingested. And then just going through vital signs. Vital signs are really important to us in toxicology. Um, combinations of things point us in different directions, right? So um, sympathomimetics cause tachycardia and hypertension. And sympatholytics or cholinergic agents, and number one example of this is opioids, cause bradycardia and hypotension. So we can separate things into categories just by knowing the initial vitals. 
And then pupils. We love to ask about pupils. So if you're going to call me, look at the pupils. If the patient has pupils, look at the pupils. It's really helpful for us to um, put things in two different categories, and it's an easy exam thing. So small pupils is always going to make me think of something like opioids. Big pupils often is an anticholinergic, something like diphenhydramine or sympathomimetic, something that gives you that fight or flight response. So the difference between um, the pupil size and the vital signs can kind of put things into different categories for us, which is really, really helpful for us to know. And in addition to that, knowing what the child has access to is like probably the number one most important thing. All right, and then toxidromes. We in Toxland love to talk about toxidromes. People make these cute, gross cartoons that are probably um, not nice to show people who might be eating donuts. But this is the best. <laughs> this is the best example of cholinergic toxidrome that I could ever. I did not create this. I found this on the internet. But this is the best example. That's uh, if you have a visual learning style um, that you could possibly know. Cholinergic toxidrome. We actually don't see it very much because we don't live in a rural area. Um, it's mostly classically caused by insecticide poisoning, um, but everything's running. So salivation, lacrimation, defecation, all those things are annoying, but the way that people get sick is bronchorrhea. They get lung, lots of stuff in their lungs. So this is a toxidrome to memorize and know in case you see it in real life, but you'll definitely see it on a test first. And then anticholinergic toxidrome. This is one that we see fairly often in the ER and in the ICU. Um, and this is that mad as a hatter, blind as a bat because they have dilated pupils, red as a beet and hot as a hair because they have flushed skin and they're not sweating, and dry as a bone because they're not salivating. So it's like the opposite of that other toxidrome. Everything's dry and red and hot and angry. And I have a story about this one. So I, um, I was at a wedding about 20 years ago and everything happened 20 years ago, I guess. Um, I was at a wedding 20 years ago, and my nephew, who was two, was the ring bearer at the wedding, and he got stung by a bee. And so everyone came running up to me as a pediatric emergency doc, and they're like, what do we do? He's about to walk down the aisle. And so I calculated a Benadryl dose in my head for him, and they gave it to him, and he got the anticholinergic toxidrome, and this is him. Um, <laughs> so. They have not forgiven me for this. I think I did the math wrong, but I was like at a wedding, you know? Um, so he was hot, red, mad, and um, they're still mad at me now, even though he is a full grown adult. So that's two adults in my family that you've seen this morning. That's Ryan. He doesn't know he's in this talk today. But anyway, that's a good way to remember the anticholinergic toxidrome, right? Like the one that Mazer caused at a wedding. All right, and then most important toxidrome for all of us, opioid toxidrome. I think we all know this. Coma, pinpoint pupils, slow breathing. If you see this, what med do you want to give? Naloxone, Narcan, exactly. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. But this is if there's one thing to like take home from today, it's knowing about the opioid toxidrome and being ready to treat it. All right, I don't know if my lab friends are in the room today. They might be able to help me with questions. Anyway, um, thanks so much to the lab folks here at Seattle Children's. We have awesome drug testing. Drug testing can be different depending on where you're working, so it's important to learn what you have, but I'll tell you what we have here, or we have accessible to us here. Um, the easiest drug test to get at Seattle Children's is called the urine drug of abuse screen. You need one cc of urine. Most urine drug of abuse screens are immunoassays, like color change, like a pregnancy test or a COVID test, and so is ours. Most of them in most hospitals test for the seven most common um, the ones that are written in a dark color, drugs of abuse. And there's lots of false positives. There's lots of things that interact with those tests. Here at Seattle Children's, we are extra. We have a few extra things seen in blue here that we also test for on our slightly fancier but still immunoassay test. So this is a quick test. Um, if it goes with the story, it's really helpful if it's positive. Um, if it's negative, that could still be the ingestion. I still would go with the history and physical um, because some things that are synthetic, that are like made in labs, will not show up positive on this test. It also depends on timing. Has this drug been absorbed and had time to get in the urine and show up positive on this test? Not a perfect test, but it can be helpful. It's really easy to get, and it's called a urine drug of abuse screen. And this is confusing because we also have 
a urine drug screen, and this is the one that's sent to Harborview. Harborview has an awesome tox lab also, and they have a gas chromatography mass spec machine that looks for a bigger range of drugs. So they can identify a lot of different things. You need a little more urine, and you need a little more time to wait, but there are fewer false positives. Um, sometimes these two tests disagree, and when that happens, we ask the lab. So this is a picture of Jane Dickerson, who helped me a lot with this talk and also helps me a lot in this world. She's one of our lab directors here at Seattle Children's. And then we also have the um, UW Chem Fellows, like the Laboratory Medicine Fellows, and the leadership at Harborview that help with this. So um, this is kind of a commercial to call the lab if you have a discrepancy between these tests. Um, this test we use if, if it's more of a diagnostic dilemma or if we're looking for a drug that's positive outside of those kind of common 10. And then can you get a toxicology blood test? There's not like a general test that we would get for all drugs. We're really looking for drug levels with these tests and we use these to plot things out on nomograms. So this is a quantitative test where you'll get a level and you're really asking for one specific thing based on what you think has been ingested or what is in the patient's house. And so we use this to determine toxicity. A great example of this is acetaminophen, which a lot of us have seen pretty commonly in the ER. Um, we get a four hour level and then we plot it on this nomogram to decide the toxicity, if it's above the treatment line or not. And then we have antidote for that. All right, so that's a, a little bit, just a little bit about testing. And then we'll go into interventions. So things that we ask you to do or maybe don't ask you to do anymore in terms of treating a patient who's sitting in front of you who's been poisoned. So this first slide is history. Has anyone ever given or seen given or been given Ipecac? Yeah, I had someone in here who was like, oh yeah, my mom gave it to me and she like still talks about it. So Ipecac was, um, is an emetic, a drug that induces vomiting. We used to give it out at the four month uh, well child check and everybody had it at home. And the advice was if your child ingests something, give them Ipecac and make them throw up. This has been proven, and this was like how you told them to do it, which is give them the thing and then shake your kid up and down, which is <laughs> problematic to me. And this is like a Frank Netter drawing. Um, <laughs> But I can't take this out because it's such important tox history. We do not recommend this anymore. Ipecac is not produced anymore and it's not given to kids. They found that basically people were like giving Ipecac to their kids for non-toxic ingestions and then they were getting prolonged vomiting and it just made a bigger problem. So this is out, but um, something to remember, tox history wise. Another thing that's very uncommon now is pumping the stomach or as we call it in tox, gastric lavage, which sounds nicer, but it's still pumping the stomach. Um, we would recommend this only if there is a truly life-threatening ingestion that just happened that has no other good treatment regimen or antidote. It's really invasive, and as you can imagine, if you're putting a big OG tube down the patient and trying to suck pills out of this little hose, or you know, even slightly big hose, it's really hard to get pills to suck through a tube. So what you're doing is sucking out the pills that have been partially um, dissolved, uh, but it's not all that, it's, it's borne out not to be all that useful. So we very rarely recommend it. Who's done this or seen this done? Yeah, <laughs> we got Tom Brogan. Okay, great. So it's kind of becoming a little bit less common. Sorry, Tom, you're on one of these we slides. We just did it. You did, last yeah. Week. We do. Last week we did it. Okay, okay, great. We do recommend it occasionally. <laughs> if we're going to do it, it's going to be an ICU patient whose airway is likely already protected, and it's easy to get a tube down, suck things out, and then usually put something down like charcoal or something else. Is that what happened? Well, we did. Oh, that's different. That's not gastric lavage. So gastric lavage is pumping the stomach, super rare. But we got a slide about that too, so that's coming. Okay, but first let's talk about this. This is my favorite patient of all time. Um, and what did he just get administered? So this is activated charcoal. I have this picture to remind me to say that often, so activated charcoal is this slurry of literal charcoal that's been activated in this way to like suck up poison and it sits in the stomach and sucks up the poison that's sitting there. It works for lots of things. Um, and this is my reminder to say that we often can give this stuff PO. 
So like syringe or they'll just drink it. And the reason is because these kids have just done something at home that they were not supposed to do. They're already like very open-minded about taking something PO that's foreign. So they're very likely to take this PO as well. If they won't take it PO, we can also put it down by NG. But this is my reminder to you all to try it PO first. We have ways of sweetening it and it actually doesn't taste that bad. We can all taste it sometime. That's something I used to do before COVID. Um, that would be hard to do in here, but we could try that sometime. So activated charcoal sticks to poisons. I think a lot of people think that it makes you throw up. It doesn't necessarily make patients throw up. Um, kind of depends on the patient, but it's not an emetic. It's just supposed to sit in the stomach and suck up poison that's sitting there. So obviously it would work best in the first hour after ingestion while well, the medicine's still in the poison. Or it's, sorry, while well, the poison's still in the stomach. Um, we wouldn't want to give it if somebody's not protecting their airway, if something burned on the way down, or if they have GI tract abnormalities. And there's a few things that it does not work for. And the easiest way to remember this, if, if it's something that's like shows up in the periodic table, like lithium, calcium, iron, that stuff does not absorb to activated charcoal. But that's information you can get from the poison center. Activated charcoal works really well for most things. And then for you, Dr. Brogan, this is whole bowel irrigation. This is something that we do recommend. We like, um, in the same way that we might do a GI clean out for someone with really severe constipation, this is something that we do to enhance el elimination of a drug that's maybe doesn't stick to charcoal. An example is lithium um, or anything that's sustained release. And we'll kind of, well, this, you do need an NG for this because it's a large volume of go lightly. It's kind of like doing a colonoscopy prep early in the child's life to rinse out all the drug from above and below. This is something we used to do a ton for iron poisoning back in the, back in the day. We also have a few other fun things to do. Um, sometimes multi-dose multi activated charcoal useful sometimes. Um, sometimes we'll recommend bicarb in the fluids to alkalinize the urine and help with excretion of certain drugs. Salicylates is the example of that. And then sometimes we'll have to um, involve our friends from nephrology and ask them to do hemodialysis for some drugs that are, that are um, easily removed by dialysis. Intralipids, who's heard of this? Intralipids for tox. This is kind of new. Um, so intralipids, you all know from giving hyperalimentation. Um, but back in, I think this was also in the 90s, uh, one of the anesthesiologists discovered that in patients with bupivacaine toxicity, intralipids worked to counteract that toxicity. And the theory, to behind, uh, the theory behind why it works is if you're putting a bunch of lipid globules into the blood and the medicine that's there is lipid soluble, it'll like temporarily get absorbed into those globules and not affect the heart and the brain and the other important bodily functions. So it's this like lipid depot theory. So we think of using lipids, which is like giving a whole bunch of extra lipid part of hyperal all at once when we have somebody who's really, really sick from a drug that's absorbed into fat. And when that happens, we recommend this drug um, as kind of a almost last ditch life-saving effort for somebody who's really, really, really sick. Um, I put a picture of lipemic blood up there to remind me that it does mess up your labs. Um, I don't think our ECMO providers love it, although we've done it in combination with ECMO and we can talk about that. And um, we only use it for severe lipid soluble drug toxicity. Here at Seattle Children's, we've probably used this a handful of times, maybe like we've recommended it maybe once or twice a year since this started happening. And then Tom, here's your picture. ECMO um, is something that we often, well not often, it's about every other year, so that's not often, but it's something that um, talks patients who are very, very sick sometimes need. And Dr. Brogan and friends are amazing at providing it. And this is a list of, um, partial list of meds um, where patients have been sick and refractory to pressors, fluid, antidotes, all the things we talk about, even lipids. And they've had to be on ECMO in order to give their body a break, um, bypass the heart and lungs, give their body a break to let the drug effects wear off. So this has been really, really helpful in a place where we have ECMO. We've used it about every other year, I think, since I started um, with really, really sick tox patients. And our ICU colleagues are really helpful with that. And thanks, Tom, for this data. And then finally, in this like interventions category, we have antidotes. Um, less than 2% of drugs that you can take have an actual antidote. 
Um, which is not what I thought when I started Tox Fellowship. I thought a Tox Fellow was just going to be like Superman giving antidotes left and right. Um, but it's pretty rare that we actually give a true antidote. The exceptions to that would be naloxone, which we'll talk about, and acetylcysteine or mucomus. We give a lot for acetaminophen toxicity. And then we have a few other cool ones, like we have a cyanide antidote kit. Um, we have methylene blue for methemoglobinemia, which is super cool, um, reverses methemoglobinemia, works really, really well, and a few other things. But most of the time, um, poisoning treatment is just really good, meticulous, supportive care, including help from our ICU colleagues and sometimes our nephrology colleagues and the poison center. So antidotes, while they're important to know, are not very commonly used. <sighs> okay, that was half an hour talks fellowship. Um, so now I'm going to switch over. I have a couple of cases to go through that kind of talk about things that we see really commonly in the world of pediatric toxicology. I'll focus this, um, this next part on toddlers, although certainly this is a big problem for all ages of people. Um, and so this is case number one, a 13-month-old who's found unconscious in the morning in his crib. And the previous night, he had been found playing with this. Hopefully, you can see this. And you can yell out if you know what category of medicine it is. Yeah, so this is an opioid. Suboxone is the trade name. Buprenorphine and naloxone is the combination of generic names that are in this product. Um, does anyone know, I'm trying to think of how to ask this in a room where someone can raise their hand. Who knows why naloxone is in this product? Mm-hmm. So thank you, that's correct. So the naloxone is in this oral product to make it harder to abuse. Naloxone does not work orally. So when people are taking this to prevent themselves from having opioid cra cravings when they have opioid use disorder, they're taking it for the buprenorphine, which is a long-acting opioid. They are not getting any effects of naloxone. But if they would choose to abuse it, like try to inject it IV, then the naloxone would actually take effect and prevent the opioids from causing any opioid toxidrome. So the naloxone is really only in there for um, prevention of abuse. It does not help this toddler who has just ingested it. So if you take an opioid PO and you're a toddler, and even if you just take one dose of your parent's opioid of kind of any kind, you're probably going to have the opioid toxidrome and you're going to be sick. And the other thing that will happen to the toddler is that the symptoms will be really prolonged. So let's say you take a dose of your parents' oxycodone, you get a dose of naloxone, it wakes you up, likely the oxycodone is going to come back and affect you again. So you're likely to need more and more and more doses of naloxone. And actually in pediatrics is where we really go big with naloxone dosing because kids are opioid mostly, no, opioid naive, so we can really go big on waking them up. And the effects of opioid toxicity in kids is very, very long acting. So we often need a lot of naloxone. And I have some examples of that. So just a reminder again of the opioid toxidrome. We will all see this and the antidote naloxone. So let's take a minute to just talk about naloxone. Um, so it's the treatment for all types of opioid poisoning. In toddlers, we give a pretty big dose. This is bigger than the dose we would give to an adult. It's 0.1 milligrams per kilo. Often these kids are 10 kilo toddlers, so one milligram is kind of our starting dose. This picture was taken in our ED um, for a patient who ingested Suboxone and needed multiple doses, like every five minutes, 0.1 per kilo of naloxone because it would work, the patient would wake up and then the suboxone would win again, the patient would have opioid toxidrome and over and over and over. So they gave multiple doses of um, naloxone until a drip was made by our amazing pharmacist. And then this patient went to the ICU on a naloxone drip that kind of kept them awake until the effects of the, the suboxone wore off. Um, so what you need to remember is naloxone, you can use a pretty big dose you can make a drip if you need to. The drug that they ingested is likely going to outlast the naloxone dosing. So almost all of these patients should be admitted for observation if you used naloxone on them. And then just thinking a little bit about synthetic opioids, which I'll talk about. Um, with synthetic opioids, which are made in these clandestine labs, 
Um, the toxicology screen may or may not pick them up as positive, depending on how close it is to the original opioid molecule. Um, but if the patient has the opioid toxidrome, it's really important to think about it and treat with naloxone to see if they wake up. And then you'll know that it was an opioid, even if your tox screen was negative. So a little bit about synthetic opioids. I'm still learning about this, and things are changing in the world. Um, but what I know right now is that there are a bunch of labs, many of them are outside of the US, that are manufacturing this illicit fentanyl and fentanyl-type drugs. So one of them is car fentanyl. There's fentanyl with different, um, slightly different molecular structures that work as opioids. And it's imported into the US. And then um, drug dealers, or people who are selling street drugs, mix it in with drugs because it's much cheaper to use this synthetic fentanyl and mix it in and make somebody thinking they're getting heroin than actually using heroin. So it can be mixed into different types of pills. And I'll show you some examples of those. Um, it can be mixed in with anything. But people are using it in order to make people feel like they're getting an opioid high. But obviously, this is not quality controlled. Nobody knows how much drug or how strong each drug is. And we know that fentanyl is like 100 times more strong than morphine. So nobody's getting the science right. And that's why one of these pills may not get you high at all. And one may cause a 100-fold overdose. So there's a very wide range of what I'll call quality control in these street drugs. And that's why we are so worried about it and why we've had such a big spike in opioid deaths. Um, and I already talked about it may or may not show up positive on a tox screen. We shouldn't be waiting for a tox screen to come back if we see somebody in coma with tiny pupils anyway. But it may or may not be detected. So it just causes all kinds of problems. Here's some examples. Um, M30s is something that we've seen pretty commonly in our ICU patients who have been opioid toxic. Um, these are the most common pills right now in Seattle that contain fentanyl. They're made to look like oxycodone. Um, and I'll show you an example, I think, on the next slide of how close they look. But they're synthesized to make people think they're buying a street version of oxycodone when actually there is like synthetic fentanyl in it. Another thing that happens with that is, so on the top is the real and on the bottom is the counterfeit. And these are some examples from the DEA. On the left is oxycodone, for real oxycodone, and then oxycodone that's counterfeit that has synthetic fentanyl in it. And on the right, but the white one is Xanax, so bars of Xanax that people use to get high. But on the, the yellow one is fake Xanax that actually has synthetic fentanyl in it. So I think telling our patients and families and everyone not to buy these drugs from anyone they don't know or take a pill from anyone they don't know is the most important right now of any time in my career. And just the data showing that um, the line that's going straight up into the sky is the overdose mortality among adolescents from specifically illicit fentanyls and synthetic products compared to all the other kind of more common things, including prescription opioids that are kind of stable across the bottom. So action items needed, right? So what can we do? There's a few things that we have been doing and can do. I think one thing that we've done really well and can continue to do is think about our opioid prescribing practices. Um, I know that a lot of people, including the AAP, have done work on what the standard dose of home opioids should be after a procedure, like after a surgical procedure, after a dental procedure, and in the ER we think about it too, after an orthopedic procedure. Usually these kids only need two or three days of opioid med, and that is what we're doing now versus the um, previous kind of like you give a 30-day supply just so you don't get a phone call thing. So we are doing much better in prescribing practices, and it's something to think about for you all when you're prescribing opioids. Just give the smallest amount that you think will be useful. And sometimes we do have patients who need opioids, but a smaller um, time frame is important to think about. And then safe storage. There's a lot of good things going on in Washington in terms of safe storage as well. Um, there are, there's a website called takebackyourmeds.org. Um, and you can also kind of Google medication take back locations. And you can see them too in pharmacies where if you do have a parent or a grandparent or somebody in your family who has leftover opioids or other meds and you just want to get rid of it, I think in the old days we used to be like, flush it down the toilet, but we don't want people to do that anymore. We want them to take it to this lockbox that are usually located in pharmacies. And there are more and more of these popping up all over where you can safely dispense of these opioids so that they're not sitting around your house waiting for a toddler to get into them or a teenager to try to get into them. 
And then naloxone. A lot of things are happening in Washington with naloxone for teens. Some great websites are um, Narcan.com and PreventOverdoseWA.org. Um, that second website that I mentioned, you can go online and actually have naloxone sent to you at home. Um, or you can go to a pharmacy and get it. So I just tried this. I went to Bartels and I was like, hey, I would like some naloxone to have. And they, um, they gave me some, but it wasn't free. It actually was kind of expensive. Uh, and you can use, it depends on what your insurance is. But we, what we want and what we all should have is a dose of naloxone in our car, in our backpack, in our purse, in case we come across somebody with the opioid toxidome. So the idea is to get naloxone into every backpack in Seattle. Um, and then for teens too, when we see teens who are at risk for opioid use disorder in the ER or on the floor, we prescribe them naloxone so that they have it for themselves or a friend. So it's something that we should be talking about openly. We're trying to get this um, more accessible and it does seem to be working. Um, and then Seattle Children specifically, um, this is the work of, um, in my department, Chris Buresh and Jesse Wall, as well as a whole bunch of adolescent providers, all our Seattle children's leaders. We now, as of, I think, exactly one month ago, have this clinical standard work substance use screening and management pathway. And many of you have, do you have a question? I have a, a naloxone comment. There is Peer Seattle. Peer Seattle. Is it a website, peerseattle.com? Uh, I think so. That's awesome. They, they at least have like vending machines that you can physically go to. That is great. So, okay, I'm gonna say this for everyone because the online people can't hear you. Peer Seattle, it's P-E-E-R, is that right? Is a place that you can Google or look up online, I should say, to find a place where there's free naloxone vending machines and fentanyl test strips. That's awesome, thank you. I'm gonna put that in my talk if that's okay with you. Okay, awesome. And then here at Seattle Children's, we are screening people for opioid use disorder, um, treating withdrawal as we can with this amazing clinical standard work pathway, and then also sending people home with naloxone and getting them to um, treatment as we can. All right, so in summary, um, PeerSeattle.com, important, or Peer Seattle, look at Peer Seattle, get some naloxone, think about opioids when you're having patient interactions. Don't wait for a drug screen to become positive in order to treat for opioid toxidrome. And remember that when you do treat it, the toxidrome may outlast the antidote. And then we'll all get some naloxone. And this is the picture to remember. All right. Let's see, time check, perfect. I have one more case and then we can open up for questions. All right, who knows what happened here? It's a two-year-old who is ataxic and somnolent after eating a brownie from grandma's purse in Washington State. <laughs> what happened? This is a brownies. I, I, I like literally cannot give a tox talk in Washington without talking about marijuana. So as you probably know, marijuana was legalized in Washington. We were the second state to legalize marijuana. Colorado beat us to it. This was like the funny joke in the beginning when it was just Colorado and Washington. But it's not really true anymore because now, really anywhere you go to practice or anywhere you live, anywhere you visit, there is a way to get marijuana um, that is decriminalized or legalized. Every state that has a color on here has some kind of decriminalized marijuana program, either medical or recreational. So it's getting, the whole map's gonna be green pretty soon. Um, so it's not just a Washington thing anymore, it's really common. I think the way I think about it is we can assume that any adult who has alcohol in their home is equally likely to have marijuana in their home. And the difference between those two things is that often marijuana comes in this like edible form that may be more attractive to a toddler than like a liquid that smells like hand sanitizer. <laughs> so Colorado got to this data first and they looked at um, pediatric, like unintentional little kids who got into marijuana um, when they first had legal marijuana. And as you can imagine, um, we saw a lot of little kids who were um, exposed to marijuana unintentionally. It was often a baked goods and grandparents got implicated in this. It was often a grandparents medical marijuana that the kids got into. We love grandparents though. And what we learned from this study and what we've learned since is that little kids who get into marijuana 
are not having any fun at all. They are a toxic, they are sleepy, they are shaky. Like they often come in with chief complaint of seizures, but it's like, it's not really a seizure. Hyperkinetic activity, um, tachycardia, anxiety, they don't, they are not having fun. And so the common things are kind of that top five but then occasionally we'll also see kids who like get intubated because they have respiratory depression. Um, they have symptoms that last several days. Um, almost, or I would say all of these kids have recovered with supportive care. So it's not contributing to the death rate or anything in the mortality data, but it's a lot of morbidity. A lot of testing happens, especially when you're not asking about this or the parents aren't giving this information because they think it's wrong. So these kids come in looking horrible and then we end up doing all these tests. And actually this next slide, you can't see this and you're not supposed to be able to, but the middle column, row column, is um, all the ancillary testing that these few patients had. So they got uh, head CTs, neuroconsult, LP, admitted to the ICU until the talk screen came back positive or the person admitted that maybe their kid got into marijuana. So it's just a lot of morbidity that happens and a lot of testing for something that we should all be talking about openly, telling people to keep away from their kids and asking about when we see an intoxicated toddler. And this is a duh um, slide that just shows over time since it was legalized the um, rate of pediatric edible cannabis ingestions has skyrocketed. So that just goes with the theory at the beginning, right? Like kids ingest things at home, this is in everyone's house now, or lots of houses, lots of houses. And um, things that are accessible to kids are going to be eaten by kids. All right, other things to know about marijuana. Um, it's been bred, hybridized, they make a hybrid now, I'm not sure how to say that, to be stronger, more potent than it was in the past. So like marijuana, the old days, is way less strong than marijuana now. And even adults are getting in, into trouble given that information. And then edibles specifically um, are more concentrated THC, which is, the, um, which is the psychoactive component that we think about and worry about with edibles. Um, they take a longer time to peak. So this happens to all ages where they take some, it's not working, and they take some more, it's not working, and they take some more, and then all of it works all at the same time, and they get this like couch lock where they can't leave their house. Um, that happens to adults too. And then they can have longer lasting effects. So we'll see these kids who are in the hospital for two days and not quite right because of ingestion of marijuana. So it's really important to know about, talk about. I think when I ask about alcohol, I ask about marijuana in the same sentence. I think when we talk about locking things up, marijuana should be one of those top things as well. All right, the rest of this Grand Rounds is really just like fun pictures that I found. So um, to show that there are a wide variety of edible products, lots of different things that um, THC can be mixed into. Many of these things, actually, I will, this will be a plug for the recreational marijuana industry in Washington. Many of these things, I'll tell you why though, that sounded bad, but it's actually good. Many of these things are illegal in Washington to be sold in recreational marijuana shops. The rule in Washington is that you can't sell anything that looks like a candy or looks like something else. So you can't have like a marijuana gummy bear looking thing. You have to have it like specifically packaged. And I think I'll show that on the next slide. So these things actually should not be um, maybe with the exception of the drink, should not be available to Washingtonians who are buying marijuana in recreational stores. This next slide features a selfie of me in a pot store. <laughs> okay, so everyone should go to a pot store and this is why. You can learn so much about what is available to people in these stores. So in Washington, we have a rule that 10 milligrams, which is the adult dose of marijuana, has to be packaged in an individual kind of child safe way. So there's an example there. And actually we also have the Poison Center logo. Um, they wouldn't let us put Mr. Yuck on um, pot, but we have like the not for kids hand and it's on everything. So if you like look in this case really carefully, you can see that everything's packaged in like single unit dose, which could still make a toddler very high, but really hard to open more than one for a kid. So in Washington, we have some safeguards. So things like this are not available in Washington. You cannot buy marijuana gummy bears, you cannot buy fake Nutella, and you cannot buy a Buddha finger. Um, but you could buy this illegally and the DEA have confiscated all of these things. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so in summary about marijuana, think about marijuana exposure. If you see a toddler who all of a sudden has weird symptoms, 
Um, talk to families when you're in clinic. In addition to all the million other things we have to do in clinic, talk to families in clinic about locking up specifically marijuana edibles. That is the thing we see the biggest problem with kids. Um, support places that make child resistant packaging. Washington's doing a good job with that. And if you see these cases, call the Poison Center because we are tabulating this data and it's important for us all to know. All right, and finally, I know I've been talking a lot about kids, but I do have a cautionary tale here for adults. Let me. A councilman from Dearborn, Michigan, is outraged over a 911 call. He wants to know why no charges have been filed against a police officer who admits to confiscating marijuana from suspects and then baking it in brownies. And once he and his wife were full and high, they thought they'd overdosed and called 911. I think I'm having an overdose and so is my wife. Overdose of what? Marijuana. So I don't know if they had something in it. Can you please send rescue? Did you guys have fever or anything? No, I'm just... I think we're dying. Okay, how much did you guys have? I, I don't know. We made brownies, and I think we're dead. Time is going by really, 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 really slow. I'll just leave that here. <laughs> well, instead of being charged... All ages. Uh, all ages. Instead of being charged, the police department let the officer resign. His wife was not charged either. So far, I feel like I have to play this because this guy's smart. On the case. Now, how do you follow a story like that? All right, so that is all the teaching I have for you today. Um, but if you want to learn more, there's a few things. Um, there's a few things for you at Seattle Children's and also in general that you can do to learn more. Um, if you love the sound of my voice, I made a bunch of podcasts, and they are on this podcast platform called PEM Currents or Pediatric Emergency Medicine Currents. Um, it's hosted by Cincinnati Children's, and it's actually a, it's also in addition to my podcast episodes. It's really good podcast to listen to, and I think I made eight or ten talks focused podcasts, so you can search for those. Um, I recommend listening to it on like double speed, so it can sound like actually me, because um, I talk really fast in real life, but not on the podcast. And then if you know how to get to Micromedics, it's something that's on all of our computers. Um, and if you just search Micromedics generically, you'll get like a formulary. But if you search Micromedics and you click this toxicology, the fourth one in right here, and then you put in the name of your med, try it today, it'll, it'll take you to this like 90 page compendium of like every person that's ever overdosed on the particular med you're looking for. And actually, top secret, this is what our spies or poison center specialists look at to give you advice. So you can look at it too. And it's easy to surf through that. It's not very user friendly, but it's easy to surf through it if you look on the left side. You can look at like maximum tolerated exposure, minimum lethal dose, every case report that's ever been written. So it's a really helpful resource if you want to like just look some stuff up while you're waiting on hold for the Poison Center or for me. All right, that's all I have today. Thanks so much everyone for being here and coming to all the Grand Rounds. Um, thanks specifically to our lab folks who helped me with this talk and all our Poison Center people. And I'll open it up for questions. Since I'm by myself, I'll have you raise your hand and then I'll repeat your question to answer it. And then I'll also look to see if there's anything online. Thanks, you guys.